The Resident Evil franchise is the most successful video game adaptation in Hollywood history. A six-film buffet of shrieking zombies, biological weapons, and psychic powers produced over the course of 15 years by the husband and wife team of Paul W.S. Anderson and Mila Jovovich. Since the release of the first movie in 2002, Resident Evil has given fans of the zombie genre everything they could ask for, and the films have also embraced the game's unbridled love of bizarre zombie mutants and grotesquely infected animals. So when it comes to picking the gnarliest death scenes in Resident Evil, there's a lot to choose from. Getting eaten by a zombie swarm just isn't enough in a series when an army of Jovovich clones take out their enemies with katana headshots. It takes creativity to get on this list, and creativity is one thing the Resident and evil movies have never lacked. You're all going to die down here. I've heard that before. One thing that makes the original Resident Evil such a great film is that it understands how suspense works. Everyone knows the zombies are coming, but you don't see one for the entire first third of the movie. That doesn't mean there are no deaths in the build-up, of course. On the contrary, the movie actually opens with a massacre, just not at the hands of zombies. The gassing and drowning of the employees of the hive is a horrifically effective way to kick things off, and it culminates with the elevator scene. The poor victim of the moment doesn't even have a name, but will still never forget the sight of her head sticking out of the AI-controlled elevator after an ill-fated attempt at escape. It's not even the decapitation itself that makes this scene so intense, it's the chillingly inevitable sequence of events. Again, this is a movie that understands suspense. <laughs> The original Resident Evil was unquestionably a horror film, but the second one, Resident Evil Apocalypse, has action movie written all over it, and nothing exemplifies this better than the church scene. While there's a wonderful, pure horror moment with the priest and his chained-up zombie sister, it's immediately followed up with a small group of survivors being menaced by three monstrous lickers. They're saved by Jovovich's Alice, who makes her entrance by driving a motorcycle through the church window, sending it spinning into a liquor and blowing both of them to kingdom come. Sure, these are just mutated zombies, and by the second movie, liquors are a dime a dozen, but this is just such a ridiculously creative kill that it has to be included. Resident Evil Afterlife takes a hard left turn after its big opening set piece, blowing up all the clones, stripping Alice of her psychic powers, and regrounding the franchise in its survival horror roots. And things get especially eerie once the Axeman shows up. Based on the Executioner, more genie character from the games, this massive villain wields an enormous axe with a hammer on one side. The unfortunate Kim Young being vertically sliced in half would probably qualify as a wild death scene on its own. But the ensuing water-drenched fight scene between the Axeman, Alice, and Claire Redfield takes things up a notch, culminating in a slick finishing blow worthy of any video game franchise. Resident Evil eventually pivoted back from horror and toward action in Apocalypse, particularly towards the end of the movie, when Alice has been recaptured by the Umbrella Corporation. While she initially seems to have lost her memory due to further experimentation, she quickly gets it back, and she's a little pissed. My name is Alice. And I remember everything. Alice takes down her captors and breaks free from the facility. On her way out, however, she proves once again that she's far from a standard-issue action hero. In a movie that features a giant zombie with a huge Gatling gun as its primary villain, there's nothing scarier than Alice staring through the lens of that security camera. This 
This is the moment you realize that Resident Evil has just shifted in a fascinating new direction and that nothing is entirely as it seems. If you thought the ending of Apocalypse was wicked, try the beginning of the next film, Resident Evil Extinction, which continues a concept of cloning in the franchise in the most dramatic way possible. The film's opening sequence is an almost note-for-note -note tribute to Jovovich's introduction in the first film, when she wakes up on the floor of the shower with no memory and wanders confusedly through her home. It's a scene that delights in the audience's confusion as Alice moves from her house to the hive to a Raccoon City hospital. Three things that definitely shouldn't be adjacent to one another or filled with lethal traps. Alice's clones die in various ways in the following films, but this one is still a gut punch that isn't exactly alleviated by the final shot of her body being thrown into a ditch with dozens of others just like it. After a series of clone reveals, Resident Evil Retribution puts yet another spin on things with what appears to be a flashback with a happily married Alice right at the beginning of the zombie outbreak in Raccoon City. You're my little angel, aren't you? Couldn't be late, remember? Oh, yeah. Get you that shirt. The thrilling scene follows Alice trying to lead her daughter to safety through a suburban hellscape. After surviving a series of close calls, you really start to believe she's going to make it. That is, until her husband reappears. In typical Resident Evil fashion, we don't know until later on that Umbrella is using their clone technology to produce a wide variety of simulations, and this suburban housewife version of Alice was one of them. Simulation or not, it doesn't get wilder than the sight of a bewildered Alice fighting off the undead without the benefit of training or superpowers, then getting eaten by her zombie clone husband. In addition to finding new ways to use the idea of Alice clones, Retribution also brings back Rain, Michelle Rodriguez's character from the first film, who has also been cloned. Multiple versions of Rain show up over the course of the movie, but the most notable is the evil one who injects herself with the horrifying Las Plagas parasite and becomes so fast and strong that not even Alice is a match for her, at least not physically. You can't kill me. I don't need to. Very few images in the franchise are as violently beautiful as the horde of aquatic undead converging on Rain and dragging her down into the depths. In the final chapter, Ian Glenn returns as Alexander Isaacs after last being seen at the end of Extinction being killed by Alice. Of course, it turns out that was a clone, and so is the one who menaces Alice for most of the final chapter. The real Isaac shows up at the end of the movie as a mastermind behind everything that's happened in the franchise. He's also enhanced himself so much that he can predict every move Alice makes before she makes it, making him practically impossible to defeat or kill. Don't bother. You don't make it. In fact, the only person who can kill Isaacs is the one person he can't predict coming for him, himself. I'm me. He's not me. Not only is this a metaphor in keeping with the general themes of the final chapter, but it's also perfectly fitting that the world is ultimately saved by a delusional clone turning on its creator. All the Resident Evil movies have their beautiful, terrifying, and creative scenes, but nothing combines all three like the Zombie Crows sequence in Extinction. Carlos. I see him. More primal than the dogs of earlier films, the scene gives you the feeling that nature itself has fallen to the T-Virus. And with that feeling comes the dread of inevitability, the cold, hard knowledge that this enemy can't be beaten. Which makes it even better when Alice shows up and lays waste to the whole flocking group of them. If humanity has any hope at all, it lies in Alice. And if you have any doubt about that, ask the crows. 
Last but not least, let's turn to the most iconic scene in the Resident Evil franchise, and one of the most iconic scenes in all of modern horror, which arrives in the very first movie. The series' most enduring villain, as it turns out, isn't Alexander Isaacs or Albert Wesker, but a grid of blue laser beams. What's that? There are so many elements working in tandem here to make this scene effective, from the unforgettable music to the mounting sense of dread as the team desperately tries to figure out what's happening. Say the words Resident Evil to a film fan and chances are the first thing they'll think of is this simple yet ruthlessly effective blue laser. Thanks for watching! Click the links in our video to watch even more from a piece of the action. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get the latest exclusive videos. Plus, hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.